fairy tale film, uh, in addition to watching fairy tale films, I was reading uh, modern fairy tale revisionist sort of stuff, things by writers like Holly Black. Um, and uh, and work, I, I blogged a novel that year uh, just to keep my head in the game. Uh, that was a, an urban fantasy play off of a lot of fairy tale tropes. And to keep my head in the game for the, the steampunk thing, um, my gaming group uh, agreed to let me steampunk our campaign. So that's that was the, the genesis of this of this uh, this talk. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Brent Vance. Uh, I write for a blog called Renaissance Dork. And I'm Renaissance Dork on Twitter as well. Um, I've been gaming for about 32 years uh, through a wide variety of genres and gaming systems. And uh, when I found out how much I was going to be doing a panel on steampunk in your RPG, I asked if I could join him because it's something I've done before and really enjoyed doing. So he graciously allowed me. Right, it's a good time. Well, in the conversation we had, apparently we have a microphone, so if you, I, I boom, so I, I don't need it. <laughs> I guess you should get it far away from me as I can. Uh, but uh, we, we sat down to talk about doing this uh, as, as a, a co-panel, and uh, the conversation was very, very easy. It was almost Almost, like we, we, we ran it through very quickly, and then I was like, we need to stop talking yeah. because this is all clearly going to come out, and I don't want it to feel reversed. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have a lot of time. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to drag it out, but we'll have time for questions and hopefully a demonstration of a, 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 a character generator that was created by a uh, standalone game called Fern. Uh, I'm not thrilled with the game or its mechanics, but I can recommend the character generator simply as a starting point. Uh, but we'll take a look at that shortly. Uh, right. Should we do these? No, see if I can. Do I have control Z here? Never been in this room. It's over there or back here. I feel, I feel like Bruce Wayne. I've never been in this room. <laughs> steampunk conventions and not academic conferences. That's because every time I'm going to an academic conference, I told them, I'm going to have to give the same stinking paper every time because you only get 20 minutes at an academic conference. It's going to be, what is steampunk? Because otherwise, when you're talking to a group of people, I mean, if they talk Jane Austen at an academic conference, people are going to have a general idea of what's being talked about. We talk about steampunk and they're just like, could you tell us what it is in the first place before you tell us your new you know, direction that you're going with it? So to that end, uh, very quickly from the, the session that I did last year. Uh, here's Deanna Kay, who was with us last year, um, in a neo-Victorian outfit. When we say neo-Victorian, uh, it is resembling, reviving, or reminiscent of the Victorian era, and I would say in the broadest sense possible. Anyone who says that steampunk has to take place in London hasn't done their homework. Rudy Rucker took it outside of London in 1990 with uh, the Hollow Earth, and there's been a number of, of Wild West pieces, including I guess the TV series Wild Wild West, some people see that as steampunk, I don't. I think it's an antecedent to it, but that's another story. Um, but in the broadest sense possible, to evoke the Victorian era. We could even say to evoke the industrial era, but I don't like the term because it gets too much technology into the mix, and we're going to be talking about a term for the technology in a moment. Um, utilizing a look at a feel, it's evocative, 
uh, this area between 1800 and 1914, and there we have the Romantic period, you know, being sort of jammed in. But that's what that's what gets drawn from in steampunk is primarily these these areas. Some people are trying to take it. To, I think in that whole how do I how do I do something different? They they sort of swing the pendulum as far as they can, and there's been some steampunk that's taken place in the Roman Empire, uh, at which point I feel like we've sort of jumped with the shark. Um, <laughs> So we've got neo-Victorianism, neo we've got retrofuturism, these are big $20 words. Um, retrofuturism is best, best understood, I believe, in, you know, look on the slide, use of style or aesthetic, considered futuristic, in the earlier era. But in steampunk, this retrofuturism is us looking back and creating a fictional idea of what the Victorians thought the future would be like. So what the Victorians genuinely wanted was equal rights for women. Um, well, not all of them, the women. We had the suffragette movement on the, on the horizon. We've got medicine, uh, medical technology. They're not interested in airships. Could you just please stop us from dying from everything? Um, give us something that, you know, uh, our, our teeth will be healthy. These sorts of things. This is what's of interest. To the Victorians. So in steampunk, we're not we're not really genuinely trying. Most authors aren't really genuinely trying to understand what the Victorians saw the future as. They're, we're, we're, we're imagining the future for them. It's a very postmodern position to be in. It's why I refuse to accept uh, any conversation that sort of starts with Sud Verne and H. G. Wells are steampunk. No, they're not. They're contemporary. Uh, speculative fiction for their day. They are arguably the grandfathers of science fiction, and for steampunk to appropriate them for their own little corner is rude to the rest of the SF fandom, as far as I'm concerned. So, opinionated, I know. <laughs> but, and just a note on the retrofuturism. I've got a technological item up here, but I need to change the slide because, uh, as of late, um, my, my impression of retrofuturism in steampunk has shifted somewhat. That there's a lot of social retrofuturism. Um, what we would what we would look at it in books uh, by writers like Gail Carriger or um, Sherry Priest, where we've got female characters with a lot of agency, with a lot of verb, and there were individuals like this in history. We know that, but they're all over the place in the steampunk universe. And they're the, these are, yeah, they're more common. Yeah, they're not as uh, off on the off on the side, and so there's there's an element of social retrofuturism that isn't uh, located in technology. And techno fantasy is what we've described the technology of steampunk as. Um, I have people occasionally who will send me an email and say, "Can you recommend some steampunk that really uses steam technology?" And I'm like, "Oh, you're making it hard for me, actually, because most steampunk imagines a fictitious, imaginary substance to power." this fantastic technology because they know, they either know steam won't work or they don't know enough about steam to make their science work. So they go with techno fantasy. It's an easier reference. Um, it's, it's a way of jumping uh, all of the, 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 the confines of, of, of big uh, techno you know, like We're not dealing with Greg Egon here. We're dealing with guys like Tim Powers and Blaylock, James Blaylock's got the best story for this. James Blaylock is one of the first three writers to write steampunk in North America and in the States. Down in California, it's part of the big three. It's Tim Powers, it's James Blaylock, and the guy who coined the term, uh, K.W. Jeter. And Jeter knows enough science to know that Blaylock and Powers don't know anything about science. In fact, Powers doesn't want anything to do with science. Most of the time, he uses magic. But in a conversation with Blaylock, he says, you and Powers are so stupid. He said, with your science, you probably, you would probably uh, take, uh, you know, you would take a problem like a black hole and stopper it up with a size such and such cork. And Blaylock said, are you going to use that idea? Because if you're not, <laughs> I'm going to. And he did, in a, in a, in a, hilarious, in a hilarious piece um, about, you know, these guys who blast off in this space to stopper up a black hole before all of the energy from our universe is dragged through into it. So, our steampunk dragon, well, what's been done to it? It's, it's been given these various elements. You know, if we look at steampunk artwork, you can see that when we compare it with the original thing, we've got these changes. What are the differences? 
And this is, this is where we learn. What difference does the difference make? How does it change things? Does it change things at all, or are we still dealing with roughly the same creature, uh, just with a different aesthetic value? And, and most of the time, I think that's more what we're looking at is just a, a general cool factor. Uh, does this dragon have to work? Does he have to have a post-colonial purpose? No, he just looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say that my, my history, uh, Brent gave you know, the many different uh, gaming uh, uh, platforms. The, the tabletop is a platform. Yeah. Um, I started with not that red book. I started with the red book that came before that one. So, uh, it was, but I love it. I miss it so much. I had to go and I had to get an eBay copy. Uh, I, I somebody had one that was still sitting in, in shrink wrap, and I, I bought it. Came with the dice that hadn't been crayoned up yet. So I spent a couple of gaming sessions with my buddies with my crayon, and, and they would look at me like this because they never experienced it. I game with a lot of younger guys, and so I let them have some of the dice to add a crayon. <laughs> For those who remember that before the, the dice came back, uh, perfectly packaged. So, but I did D and D, and then I, I grew up. I, I grew up in a Baptist church where D and D was evil. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to hell. Um, I'm kind of thinking maybe a panel for next year would be Confessions of a Baptist Dungeon Master. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you about the time that I took D and D to a church game night. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> but Tolkien. That's okay. So we had to get rid of the D&D stuff at some point because it just got to be too much. And now I came across Middle Earth role playing. I'm like, this can't be bad. He hung out with C.S. Lewis. You know, even though in those days, I mean, Baptists and Catholics didn't mix. I knew that Tolkien had, you know, at least he was in the camp. He was part of the family somehow. So it would be okay. And this was how I could, I could get away with playing uh, my favorite game. Uh, so we were we were working with ICE's uh, Role Master. For those who have never played Role Master, if Dungeons and Dragons is Windows, Role Master is Linux. <laughs> it's really complicated, and you have to know what you're about. Lots of tables, lots of stuff to, to be writing down. It's crazy. Um, and so we were working, yeah, we were working with with that. And I, I went and grabbed Castle Falkenstein, uh, which was an, not a super early. Steampunk piece. There were other pieces before this. I think uh, Space 1888 or was it 1889 um, was early than Falkenstein. But it, this is a great source for flavor, if nothing else. And I guess that's the first thing I'd say is if you're going to steampunk your RPG, don't change your your system. If you're working D20, keep working D20. If you you know if you're playing, uh, I don't even know. Anymore. <laughs> no, it's just that it's eluding me right now, but I'm thinking Rifts, Rifts. You know, if you're already working with Rifts, Rifts actually, you've got all the source books already. You know, you just need to coddle them together. Gurps is another one like that. What's that? Gurps. Yeah, Gurps, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, lots, of, lots of really great resources with Gurps. Gurps has uh, some, of the, some of the best stuff historically, I think, uh, in just looking over their, their stuff when I was uh, trying to decide how we were going to make a shift from doing this Middle Earth campaign to steampunk. And then I thought, well, why would I bother to do that? Why would I bother to stop having my guys playing in Middle Earth when we've been doing it for 10 years? I've been doing it for longer. I know Tolkien's world like I know no other. So why would I, why would I leave that to go and construct a completely new steampunk thing? Rather than do that, why don't I just commit the heinous crime of taking Tolkien's perfectly verdant landscapes and filling them with coal smoke. Right? <laughs> this is like some sort of cardinal sin for Tolkien fans, I think. Was that or Saruman? Exactly, exactly. And so looking at Saruman in the, the War of the Rings, and then most of the stuff that, that ICE put together for the Middle Earth uh, source books took place 1,500 years before the War of the Ring, when uh, the, head, the, the head Nazgul was holed up it north of uh, north of Rivendell, really, in a, in a, in a land called Amar. I got to wondering, well, what if Saruman, because he'd already figured, he'd already jumped off the, the good guy's post long, long before. I mean, there's a, sort of this admission that he's been plotting this for quite some time. 
And it only took a little fudging of, of the timeline. And this, was, this, this is key to steampunking a world. You have got to be okay with messing the history up royally. <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend that lives out in Toronto. He's a historian and a Star Wars fan. And I drive him mental when I talk about steampunk and Star Wars. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, and then we can do this, and you have this whole moment, and he's like, you can't do that, because that's not where the X-Wings remain. I don't care! I'm steampunky. I get to mess with it. That's, that's what happens. There's a, there's a complete disregard for history. People think steampunk is about history. And it is, but it's about playing with history. It's about putting a bunch of history into a sandbox, and then just enjoying it. Like when I came home yesterday, and my daughter runs up to the... the, the you know, to greet me, and she's got a Mrs. Potato Head, and she goes, Dad, Mega Mind just saved Mrs. Potato Head from the, and I think it was one of the Transformer villains. And I was like, wow, that's a serious mashup. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that, you know, that's what we do when we're kids. We can play these things up, and then later on we get this sort of proprietary, these borders for our geekdom. And the nice thing about steampunk is, uh, I think, the, the pastiche element, this sort of let's just draw in from wherever we want. We'll go and we will do this to any genre. Um, steampunk, by the way, people will say, what, what, genre, what genre would you compare it to? I don't even consider it a genre. Consider it, as I said, an aesthetic. And you lay it over other things, and it changes them. Um, and, and you see it because we've got steampunk romance, we've got steampunk fantasy, we've got steampunk SF, steampunk uh, superhero adventures, um, even steampunk uh, pretentious literature. Uh, people trying to write the next great academic work using steampunk. So I'm going to steampunk Tolkien's world, that's what, I, that's what I figured. So I took Iron Kingdoms as a bit of a template, an idea of trying to think, okay, what do you do when you mash medieval up with, with steam technology? But this, I mean, in some ways this is historically what happens. We move with the Industrial Revolution out of um, these antiquated modes of uh, being, of living. And this is, what's going, this is what's going to happen to Tolkien's Middle Earth, is I've got, a, I've got an early pact between Saruman and which King of Angmar. Sauron doesn't even have to come into it. We don't need the ring, because the thing that the ring will bring comes via industri the, an industrial revolution. And the first thing that I did was I firebombed the elves, because you can't have a bunch of tree huggers running around in a world uh, where you're going to put up great big smokestacks. Um, and what, what, this, what this gave me an opportunity to do was to try to create a resistance um, this is not essential. You might read this on the web. It's, it's kind of BS. Um, some people will say, you have to have oppositional politics. That is, you have to have a punk element in steampunk. K.W. Jeter was making a joke when he coined the term. There is political steampunk, and there is steampunk that has this whole resistance, this whole rebellion thing going on. But then there's steampunk that is like the agent of the crown, who's totally hip-hip and the queen mom, and you know, let's go and oppress some nations. Um, <laughs> so you've got, you've got both, both, both ends of the, the spectrum there. You don't need to have it, but I knew that I wanted it because I thought I could hold them up inside Moria. So this, this image from the edge, edge of twilight, uh, I just did a photoshopping with, a, with an image of a, of a train heading straight for you and showed this to my players to help them understand I've run a rail all the way through Moria. It goes from one end to the other. You are all inside Moria. You are part of the oppressed uh, group. Dwarves, elves, humans, all living together and oppressed by Sar uh, Saruman and the Witch King. We were able to do something that, that isn't very common in any Middle Earth setting. We were able to bring in half orcs and make them uh, part, of, part of the team um, because some people were, were aren't, they're not happy with the way things are. Um, to help my players get a grip on this, I went and, and we, we shopped through the Iron Kingdom's uh, line of miniatures. And as far as steampunk miniatures go for most of the, the, the gaming uh, platforms, you can't do better than what these guys have. You can get historical stuff, Call it the two figures are pretty good, but I gotta say, uh, the Iron Kingdom, some War Machine stuff, has what I think is some of the most evocative um, figures for steampunk gaming. Um, just from this alone, you know, we've got this dwarf with a big fat stogie, and one of my players immediately said, is that Longbottom Leaf? 
I said, yes, the, uh, that's what the hobbits are up to now, is they're just a tobacco manufacturer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's all they get to do anymore. It's not pipe weed, though. We turn it into cigarettes and cigars. Um, one of my other players looked at this magician and noticed that there's this ball sitting on the staff and began to wonder about the idea of taking magic and using it as a sort of power source, with like, like an electricity uh, sort of mana source. And so he put, an, he put a light bulb on his own staff in the game that he used, it was like a filament light bulb, that's what he said, it was supposed to be this really clunky globe, and it would, it would glow as a, as a source, you know, to, to, to detect magic. Um, I'll deal a bit first with this. Uh, I think they're called gun rays in, in Iron Kingdoms. Well, that's a Nazgul with pistols if I've ever seen one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now you've got the threat of these things that will, you know, when their weapons get into you, they crawl towards your heart to turn you into one of them, and now they've got ballistic weapons. Now they've got weapons that can, you know, reach you from a distance. That's bad news. So it just it just raised the threat level so very quickly. But what about the players? Can they have guns too? Looking at this guy, they're like, hey, that's awesome. He's a gun mage. What if instead of having people, and and this 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 grew into part of the story. What if instead of having this inherent magic, because that's how Tolkien's world works, this inherent magic that you draw from sort of the fact that you're an elf or the earth itself, you began manufacturing items that would do the work for you. And this is some of what Saruman was up to. Um, so we had, we had these gun mages, and that, that ended up being a bit of a mashup with uh, Stephen King's Gunslinger series, so that uh, those, who, who, those who bore the pistols became the, uh, the rangers of the north, which is really what uh, Roland is in a lot of ways, for those who are familiar with this, is it's sort of Stephen King's play on Aragorn, a much more fractured and tragic Aragorn, but we're dealing with a similar character. So we took the Rangers of the North and turned them into, a, into this band of gunslingers. Uh, and they, the, the players who were using this used Roland's liturgy that he says, I do not aim with my hand, I aim with my heart. Uh, they, would, they would bring that into the game. So it was really, it was very cool because we had, we had pulled so many things together. And Brent does this as well in, in some of the slides that he has, and I'll let him speak to that when he gets there. But this image is from CG Societies. Um, challenge a few years back to steampunk a myth or legend. This is Samuel Polk, as you can see from the slide. Well, he looks like Gandalf to me, <laughs> right? Gandalf with a, with a steampunk robot arm and a pistol. And it just felt very badass, and I wanted to do something with it. And so I had brought Gandalf in as a character when they were in Moria, but I, I made sure that he didn't, have a, he didn't have a full head of hair. And that really threw everybody off. It's amazing what you can do when you turn a classic character with a really you know, great mane of hair into a completely cue ball uh, guy with, with a bit of a goatee. I mean, he's going incognito, he's gotta look completely different from the man that he was before, but I kept dropping certain lines that were Gandalf's. They never picked up on it until the, the day that they had to flee Moria uh, with the Balrog hot on their tail. And they got out and Gandalf rescues them and there was the whole, you shall not pass, and they all just went, <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's dead now. We don't have him anymore, and he comes back. And when, we, when, when I brought him back, I brought him back this way. I brought him back to sort of a Samuel Cole. Uh, Gandalf's resurrection isn't so shiny as it was in Lord of the Rings, where he gets to go to the Undying Lands. No, the dwarves found his completely um, half, -obliterated, his half obliterated body, and they, they rebuilt him. The bionic Gandalf, I guess. <laughs> bionic, bionic Gandalf. <laughs> and one last, one last slide from, uh, from the Myths and Legends thing. Um, but this, to me, looked a bit like Orthan, a bit like Isengard. And I started wondering how I could bring that in. Our players had sort of done as much as they could with the whole gunslinger Moria uh, bit, and they were, they were ready for a change, so we steampunk Harry Potter at this point. Uh, we made Isengard into a school of witchcraft and wizardry, but it's one where uh, the headmaster is Saruman. You know, so I mean, if you no longer, if you no longer, you know, have a really nice old man running the show. <laughs> now you've got this guy who's basically made the deal with the devil. Uh, what does that do to your storyline? But they begin as the trusting students. They began as the trusting students, and then they, they found out what was really going on behind the scenes. So it was it was a, it was a great deal of fun. And, and halfway through this, I came across China Mievel's Perdido Street Station, and, and there's a moment in the middle of this. And what kills me about Mievel is that a lot of people think he's he's just he's, he's 
writer. He's brilliant on a level that you'll never comprehend. And I'm like, wow, I don't know. Plot-wise, I don't find him to be that much. Uh, he's not terribly original by way of comparison to other people. Uh, Perdido Street Station is the plot line for Aliens, Blade Two, or Mimic. Uh, it's a bug hunt. Like, you go and you have to find the monsters. And there's some other stuff thrown in there that feels really weighty. He's an incredible wordsmith. So the language that he uses, I think, inflates the value of what he's saying, but I don't know that he's all that brilliant. And one of the reasons I don't think that is that he's got these very standard D20 uh, adventurers right in the middle of his uh, book. Now there's a few typos here, my apologies. But, I mean, I read this and I was like, this sounds like a descriptor for the standard um, adventuring, dungeoneering party. Uh, there were three of them. They were immediately and absolutely recognizable as adventurers. Rogues who had wandered the Regamal and the Simek and the Felid, and probably the whole of Bale. They were hard, hardy and dangerous, lawless, stripped of allegiance or morality, living off their wits, stealing and killing, hiring themselves up to whoever and whatever came. I mean, you have to think about the, the, the hook for most adventures. It's like, we have a lot of money. We're in. You know? <laughs> I, spent, I spent my treasure on alien wars. Um, they, were, they were inspired by dubious virtues. A few performed useful services, research, cartography, and the like. I mean, when did you ever have a player who ever got to use any of those skills? That was the thing about ICE. They had skills for everything. And I would have players who'd be like, I'd like to take sign language. And I'm like, you'll never use it. <laughs> you'll wish you did. I've got lip reading. Good for you. Um, most were nothing but tomb raiders, because this is where a lot of, you know, adventures uh, end up happening. They were scum who died violent deaths hanging on a, cer a certain cachet among the impressionable through their undeniable bravery and their occasionally impressive exploits. And with that, um, I turn the table over to Brent. Uh, just the bottom. Or clicking on the mouse. But I can, I can be your clicker if you want to wonder. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've actually had occasion to steampunk uh, campaigns twice. Um, neither time was completely my idea, not that I'm opposed to the steampunk genre, obviously, or else I just wouldn't have done it. Um, but uh, the players were really excited to get into that sort of feel of what we were talking about, the, the retrofuturism and the, uh, mostly they wanted guys who could like build really cool clockwork things. So. Um, that informed a lot of what we did. Um, for those of you, so the two that I did um, was the Eberron campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons, uh, a later version of it, and uh, the second one I'll talk about is the uh, uh, Cthulhu, uh, Call of Cthulhu game, uh, specifically the Cthulhu by Gaslight, which is the 1890 setting for uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and both of them on the surface have uh, steampunk elements, and both of them are fairly easy to add steampunk into, uh, but there were different challenges for each. Uh, for Eberron, um, it was actually, it was the campaign setting that uh, Wizards put out to try and uh, give a fast-paced sort of pulp action uh, setting for their game. Um, the main system had sort of this nice high fantasy feel to it, um, and they wanted something a little grittier and a little bit more uh, pulling from things like the, the Tarzan and uh, Lost World and things like that. Um, it's also sort of a noir thing. Yeah, they, they t and you can see the top picture there is very much the uh, sort of investigative mystery. They're, they're in the, the smoky, foggy streets of Sharn, um, you know, standing over a dead body. You know, and you sort of look at the picture and wait for the voiceover. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the bottom one there again, yeah, very gritty, sort of, uh, that's the down below of Sharn. Uh, Sharn is this enormous city which is um, like of mountainous height. So the rich people get to live at the very top, where the air is clean and everything's nice, uh, and they can flip around by airship. Um, the rest of the people get to live sort of in the, the down below. And then the really the scum of the earth, which were a lot of the humanoid races like the and stuff like that, uh, actually live below the city uh, in these very dark, uh, dank, smoke caverns. So, so uh, you can see there's a lot of elements that are uh, already sort of lending themselves to steampunk. You have the airships, uh, which in Eberron were like the fire ships. Uh, you 
see the, the lightning rail. So that, I mean, there's a very steampunk feel to things already. As soon as you have trains uh, and airships, uh, anyone who's in steampunk sort of starts to feel a little bit more at home. Um, uh, and you also have sort of the ABC demonstrated there. Uh, all the airships are parked up there, and all the people who have to walk are sort of down at the bottom there. Um, the problem is, <laughs> uh, like any other D&D campaign uh, setting, um, Eberron has a lot of magic involved in it. Um, and magic and steampunk don't always go together. They can. Um, looked at from a certain angle, a lot of the stuff that they came up with for the, uh, the fuel sources for, uh, for, to replace steam um, could be looked at as like sort of magical. Uh, because basically if, you're, if you have a science and you're not explaining it, it might as well be magical. Um, so I needed to do something in the campaign to take that away so that there was actually a reason for people to get involved in building like uh, clockwork automatons and, uh, and so that the artificers uh, actually had something to do. Um, Eberron had uh, put in a class that was specifically about building uh, awesome and wonderful items. Uh, and it seemed a shame to just have that be sort of more of a, you know, a magic user with tools. So one of the things that I did, and this was based on uh, again, as Mike said, when you get involved in doing something like this, you need to be able to be okay with tossing away history. Uh, so the campaign had presented uh, a history in which the world had just come out of uh, a horrible, horrible war. Uh, and it was a magic-based war. Uh, and it had ended um, because of a horrible magical cataclysm, uh, which then led to um, the various uh, rich families of the world splitting up how magic could be used, uh, which led to uh, magic being very restricted. And in the campaign setting, that was simply because we don't want this horrible war to happen again. But when I decided that I needed to uh, add a little bit more technology into this and take away a bit of the magic, uh, what I did was I tinkered with it. Um, the reason that they can't uh, that all these families have split up uh, the control of magic uh, and each sort of responsible for their own area. Uh, it's not that they're afraid that this magical cataclysm will happen again, it's that because of magical, magical cataclysm, most of the magic had actually gone away. It basically depleted, whatever you want to call it, the mana level for the planet. So there just wasn't as much magic to draw from. Um, of course, you have an entire culture that up to that point has been built on magic being used in everyday life. Um, you know, the, the Eberron setting has things like, uh, you know, uh, magical items to keep food fresh is very common, that sort of thing. Um, so the families had to get to work uh, replacing a lot of that stuff with technology. But they didn't want that secret to get out necessarily. Uh, and when people get used to traveling around in flaming airships and lightning rail, um, they don't really want that taken away from them. So, <laughs> what they did is they struck a deal with uh, all these uh, artisans who had accidentally discovered um, super cool magnetism. Uh, they, had, uh, they had discovered that they could actually recreate the effect of a lightning train, um, but with, just with science. So that was great. Um, so the artisan, uh, the, the artificers and the magic users got together, uh, and they came up with a certain bargain, that they would cover up the fact um, that all of this magic had gone away by, you know, heavy use of illusion spells and stuff like that. So your fire, your uh, airship still flies, and it still looks like it's being um, flown about with this big flaming wheel, which, honestly, um, one of the reasons I made the change is that I could never really understand exactly how a big wheel of fire uh, makes your ship fly. That sort of seems like a fairly dangerous thing to do. But... Well, it's like flying around in a big hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so all of these effects were still there, uh, but they weren't there for the same reason that everybody thought they were. 
uh, there was this sort of uh, magical layer that was pulled over, magical wool that was pulled over everybody's eyes so that they believed that things were going on business as usual. Um, I, found, I found that interesting when we were having that conversation that we both had fuel crises. I think yeah. running around inside, I, I didn't really address that, that was the, the mana, the mana pull. Um, we were doing, we were doing the same thing with the Merck campaign, where they were basically leeching magic out of the earth. Yeah. And that sooner or later you were going to run out of it. Um, and this crisis, you know, or the post-crisis, um, that we had both gone in those directions uh, without, you know, any consultation, because there were <laughs> up until four days ago. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was really important to give that sort of, uh, that feel to it. Now, it was um, fairly easy from that point on to make the campaign steampunk, um, because actually once you introduce those elements, the rest of the campaign, it does sort of flow that way. Um, you have uh, actually built into the campaign world uh, a group called the Wayfinders, whose mission is to like go to the far corners of Eberron and explore and stick their noses where they're not welcome, and you know that was right up our players' alley. So, um, but behind it all, there was this sort of um, vast conspiracy going on that allowed them to, um, while on the surface they got to do the the sort of the the pip pip daring do. Adventure stuff. Uh, there was also a mystery for them to discover that they didn't start off knowing about. Um, so probably one of the races in Eberron uh, are called the Warforged, um, and they were uh, essentially living constructs. Uh, they were a combination of uh, of mechanics and magic, uh, and as the name suggests. Uh, they were built to fight the war, uh, towards the end of the war. Obviously, it was hard to convince people to uh, you know, jump in and go up there when uh, they were just get obliterated by a magic user with spells. Um, and people were dying at a horrible, horrible rate. Luckily, not necessarily for the war forge, uh, <laughs> they managed to build uh, a race uh, of people to go out and fight. And they didn't start off trying to build a race, obviously they just wanted to build uh, easily repairable automatons to do their fighting for them. Um, what happened though is that the Warforged woke up. Um, they developed sentience. Then the war ended, because the Warforged were actually put into mass production very close to the end of the war. Um, the war ended with this horrible cataclysm, uh, and now you have thousands upon thousands of these Warforged with really no purpose in life. They were built to be soldiers. And <laughs> Uh, and they've accidentally woken up, which is, uh, you know, uh, a bit inconvenient for the people who built them. Um, they're trying to be people, trying to find their own way in this sort of post-war. Um, and I steampunked them up a little bit, so uh, unfortunately I didn't have a picture for it, but they, they were very much more mechanical. You could actually sort of see the gears, the elbow joints, and things like that. Uh, they weren't quite as smooth and nice as this, as these pictures uh, would have you believe. Uh, and one of the big things for the Warforged was trying to figure out who they were. Uh, and they became the crux uh, of our campaign because they were um, a blend of magic and technology. Um, so they could be the breaking point. They could be the reason that people in general, uh, would find out that uh, magic wasn't working anymore. Um, so there were people invested, heavily invested, in keeping the Warforged from finding out who they were uh, and how they had come to be. Um, and that gave me a sort of an overarching uh, campaign structure and I guess plot line for my players to, to follow up. Not that they knew that right from the very beginning, because you know, it, it's sort of boring to just drop that in your player's lap at the, the far start of the campaign. And that, that's, that's a really key point when we do this. If you do this to a, a medieval fantasy world, like if you're going with a, 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 a sort of already steampunk <clears throat> system, 
then your players may read player's manual and know. But if you're taking a, a world that they know, or in the case of Eberron, taking it on this, it feels similar to you know the, the classic D and D universe, and then you're you're now you've twisted it. It's it's a real it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun to let them discover how the world has changed. That's that's a really cool uh, thing. So it's great to have, great to have those sort of conspiracy moments. In the, yeah. In the... Yeah, and I mean, as much as uh, Wizards tried to sort of change things up with Eberron, Eberron still was primarily a D&D campaign. Yeah. And so players who are familiar with playing Dungeons and Dragons are used to buying into a certain a certain style of play and a certain style of world. Um, so it was actually pretty easy to keep the wool over their eyes. You know, if I tell them that the ship is flying because there's a big flaming ring around it, they go, okay, <laughs> yep, yeah. that's fine. What, trains ride on uh, like big bolts of lightning? Awesome, excellent. We're yeah. not even gonna dig our noses into that any deeper until later on in the campaign when it's like, um, they come across a train yard where um, there are a bunch of mechanics and artificers quickly rushing around and trying to fix this coal fusion technology that they've accidentally discovered um, so that their you know, modes of transportation don't explode. Uh, and then they're like, well, why don't we ever see these? And then they see one actually being started up uh, and imbued and sent out, and they realize, oh my god. So that was sort of the, uh, um, sort of the behind the scenes of the campaign that they discovered as they played. Um, so from the very beginning, I gave them the surface feel of the steampunk that they wanted. Um, so that they would be happy. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I played around with their tiny little minds because that's how I <laughs> as a game master. Um, you want to know what that's in Yes! So, <laughs> that brings us into Call of Cthulhu. Actually, the Call of Cthulhu campaign came before the Eberron campaign, but I sort of wanted to talk about it a second. I don't know why I put the downer in a second. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, Is it the end of the world? Yeah, exactly. Uh, is everyone familiar with H.P. Lovecraft? Yes, okay, good. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft created, of course, the, the sort of the Cthulhu mythos, um, um, sort of laid the, the seeds for it, and then a bunch of other authors jumped on, and was like, this is awesome! Um, <laughs> the first yeah. open source. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, apparently, you were totally thrilled about. It. Yes, yeah. Um, about 1981, uh, a company called Chaosium put out uh, the Call of Cthulhu horror role-playing game, which was, um, if, such a, if a company were to try and put out a game like this today, at like say a major company like Wizards of the Coast and stuff like that, it probably wouldn't get out of like, the boardroom brainstorming session, um, because it is <laughs> It is a game in which you really can't win. Um, you create investigators, um, and they're investigators in the loosest sense of the term. Uh, the, the original setting is in the 1920s, and so you have people like uh, reporters, ex-soldiers, uh, policemen, uh, you can play a priest, um, you, know, you can play a nun, um, you can play a tribesman. Um, but they are essentially average people who encounter horrible, mind-altering things that they didn't know existed before. Um, and best case scenario, um, it changes them. Worst case scenario, um, it destroys their psyche utterly before they die. Um, so actually, best case scenario, they die before their psyche is utterly destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Worst case scenario. That's why you always keep that one last bullet, because it can save That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so that sounds like an awesome game, right? That sounds like something that everyone wants to sit down and play. I want to play a game where there's absolutely no chance I can win, and my entertainment comes from um, just seeing how horrible, uh, horribly insane I can go uh, before someone puts me out of my misery. Um, but it was, actually. <laughs> they released the game, and it was like insanely popular. Uh, people loved it, and they loved it so much that about uh, three years later, uh, they put up Cthulhu of a Gaslight, which is the setting for the 1890s England. Now, again, 
on the surface, it's a fairly easy one to steampunk, right? Because we're already in Victorian England. So, you know, bam, I've got the setting now. Um, all you need to do at that point is add in, um, you know, the, the steampunk elements that you become used to with retrofuturism. The problem is, um, if you uh, go to the next slide there, the difference between steampunk uh, as a as a genre and as a feel, uh, and Lovecraftian horror as a feel. So in the top corner there, uh, that is the big bad guy. That is Cthulhu. That's the guy sort of behind the scenes that no one knows about because if they know about him, they go absolutely insane. Um, and he and others like him, uh, the Elder Gods, are responsible for like 99% of all the, the abysmal horror that's in the world that we try and ignore. Play that off against steampunk, <laughs> which you can sort of see in the bottom here. Uh, it's very light. It's very sort of like, you know, pip pip, you cheerio. Uh, it's very happy and positive. Uh, <laughs> and it's not a, uh, it's not necessarily your obvious fit when you're going for a great Cthulian horror. Um, you know. So I had two choices. I could either set up a campaign in which I allow them to be um, happy, um, fluffy, steampunk people, and let them have their adventures, and let them enjoy themselves, and do all the daring do that they wanted to do, uh, and then die suddenly and horribly, <laughs> because they've been completely, have kept themselves completely ignorant of what was Cthulhu and stuff going on in the background. Uh, or, I could use that as the reason the, that um, a lot of this boundless optimism and, uh, and excitement and positive attitude is there, is because they're really trying to ignore the fact that all of this horrible, horrible stuff is happening in the background. Um, and this all came out of a character that I played in an 1890s campaign, which when he went insane, that's what he became. Uh, he was a dilettante character, which was a character that you could roll up Basically, if you didn't want to play anything else, you were a dilettante. So you had a smattering of skills from all over the place, and you just sort of, generally you were rich, you were the spoiled rich. Um, when he went insane, not if, when, um, he became boundlessly optimistic. Um, we can do anything. Nothing is unachievable. We will smite the enemy, and we will win the day. In that very typical stiff upper lip British way of looking at things. Uh, there is nothing we cannot achieve. Um, the problem, of course, is that he became that way in the face of some horrible, nasty thing with like strange geometries and tentacles and, you know, quite obviously, no one's carrying the day at that point. Um, so that being the driving force behind all of the steampunk elements of the campaign was that, yes, this Cthulhu horror is going on behind the scenes. Um, and people are aware of it, and it's nasty and stuff like that. But, you know, look at all this cool stuff we do. Look at all the adventures we get to have. You know, this is awesome. We're making little steam boys. And, <laughs> you know, you can enlist in the Flying Corps and, uh, and have great adventures. And those adventures might take you to Antarctica, where you discover something living in ice that kills you. Yep. Um, <laughs> Well, and we, we talked about this uh, when we were chatting about it. I said, it's such a cool opportunity if you've got the right group. I mean, mm -hmm. some players, if they have an agenda, they're going to play their thing, no matter what you want them to do. But if you have a group who's, who's pretty up, they're up for a challenge, they're up for something different, I think of Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman's um, Good Omens. Good Omens. Yeah. You know, here's the end of the world, and it's still got that Pratchett uh, humor to it. Um, taking the Cthulhu scenario and putting that stiff upper lip kind of individual into the middle of this could be uproariously funny. I mean, just mind-numbing horror, and the response is, oh, that's different, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that, that has a really interesting opportunity for a comedic game. Yeah. In the midst of in the midst of this horror, like there you are, you're going to go yeah. freeze to death in the Antarctic. But no, uh, I think we'll have tea. We were lucky enough to have two players who uh, uh, 
uh, sort of decided that their characters were interlinked. So uh, one of them was playing a dilettante. Um, the other one was playing his manservant. <laughs> so in the middle of all this steampunk Cthulian horror uh, going on, uh, we had the Jeeves and Worcester show <laughs> um, between the two of them. So it was very much sort of like, you know, everything is positive. Uh, nothing, there's nothing that can't be solved by a good cup of tea. Um, or, being, or being upset about the fact that they wrecked your cravat. Yeah, exactly. Like, my, God, my hair's must. It, a really good way of, of if you need a, a flavor for this, check out Gail Carragher's uh, Parasol Protectorate series. Because there are occasionally moments where bad stuff goes down, and their response is just, well, that was rude. You're know, <laughs> attacked by a vampire, and it's, wait, we haven't been properly introduced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. Uh, so one of the things that I had to do as well to make the players happy during this campaign uh, is that I had to give them sort of as much steampunk feel as I could. Um, the, the Cthulian horror was my responsibility, um, but I had to give them a chance to sort of have, uh, to enjoy as much of the steampunk aspects as I possibly could. So one of the ways that I did that, and this is one of the ones, I don't normally go prop heavy when I'm doing uh, role-playing games. Um, but for this one, it sort of made sense. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so you can sort of see the, the blending of Steve Punk and, and Cthulhu there. Uh, you've got your airship doing a, uh, a Jules Verne style rescue from a, an undersea craft uh, somewhere in the Arctic, uh, while these tentacle creatures are trying to <clears throat> destroy them all. Um, and that actually inspired one of the adventures. Uh, I didn't want to go quite at the mountains of madness. I didn't want to be so on the nose, but really with, with that in the genre, you can't really avoid doing Arctic expeditions, so we sent them off. Um, although I did give them the option uh, of doing a, uh, a Captain, uh, Captain Park version of a uh, uh, Arctic, Arctic expedition. Uh, Captain Park was a guy who, in the uh, 1800s, got uh, funding from the National Geogra Geographic Society uh, to go on a polar expedition. Uh, and they funded his expedition. Uh, and he went away, and he came back with all these wonderful things from the, the South Pole, like artifacts from the local tribesmen, and, uh, <laughs> you know, wonderful little pieces of pottery, and, <laughs> and all the rest of it. What he'd actually done is he'd taken all the National Geographic money, um, gone off to a secluded part of England, um, sort of disguised himself, uh, and then gone off to these other like, sort of craft and antiquity shops, and just sort of grabbed things that caught his eye, um, buffed them up a bit, repainted them, changed them up, and returned triumphantly to London uh, from fresh from his, his polar expedition. Uh, they opted not to do that. They opted to go for the full polar expedition. So, uh, so we did that, huskies and all. And, uh, um, but one of the things that I did, uh, this isn't the one that I used, but I found it later on. There was a gentleman in Germany who had done a very similar thing of uh, the steampunk uh, theme uh, role-playing games done. Uh, the bottom, uh, I guess from your perspective, right-hand corner, uh, that's a character sheet for the game that he was running. So, and it's actually a character sheet for a Cthulhu game. Um, so it has, and, you know, it basically looks like an investigator's desk. You know, sort of all his things strewn up in front of him, all the papers and, and stuff like that. Um, so that's one page from the character sheet. So I did something very similar. Um, I issued each of the players, uh, they weren't allowed to use character sheets, first of all. Uh, I issued each of them uh, just a notebook, just a blank notebook. And I told them, this is where you're going to keep all your player information in, uh, like all of it. And, uh, you know, and you can doll it up however you want, you can make it look however you want, but this is your character's journal that also happens to include all your player information. Um, and they loved that, you know, because that gave them the chance. We had a guy in who was uh, an artist, so he just, this thing is like sketched all over the place and in the margins, and um, at one point he grabbed another journal of the same type, glued the back cover of the first one to the front cover of the other one, so he could just continue it on that way, uh, and just kept making books. Um, and this is the one where I went prop heavy, so I went, I gave them, um, when they found the book, I would try and give them an actual book that they could look, look at. Um, 
it's really nice. There was a company for a while that was putting out hardcover versions of German uh, German textbooks from the 1800s, just reproduction copies. But it was like you know embossed cardboard covers and things like that. So they, as long as you didn't actually touch them, uh, <laughs> they looked like original 1800s um, style you know, books and things like that. So those would be the prop books of magic that they would find, things like that. Um, stuff that would keep them sort of in the steampunk mindset uh, as much as possible. So that when I did actually spring some Cthulian horror on them, uh, like tentacles trying to drag down an airship while they're doing a rescue, um, it actually took them by surprise. Um, and then it became about playing against that um, because you know they're trying to stay positive and they're trying to stay happy um, while this horrible thing with multiple mouths and tentacles and 18 legs and you know, whatever else uh, is trying to drag them under the cold, cold water. Um, and again, things like uh, the map at the top there, um, you know, those became artifacts that they found so that. Um, you know, that would sort of take them out of, uh, you know, give them a sense that this sort of stuff had been going on for quite some time. But, you know, through it all, we sort of managed to have a, a really rollicking good time, and they got all their steampunk adventure, uh, and I slowly got to destroy their minds one by one, <laughs> which is, again, how I enjoyed myself as a kid. Um, that's uh, what I wanted to say. I love, I love the character sheet. That's something that I now want to run with that because <laughs> the idea of giving someone a collection of things, uh, even even if that was just like this, all you know, you just fill in your information on this thing that looks like a piece of art. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this, you know, this cameo of somebody who is who is that? You don't even have to you don't even have to tell a player who it is. A player will fill that in for you. Oh, yeah. um, give them give them these things and ask them to give you a character back. And on that on that note, uh, I want to show you guys this this uh, Vern uh, character generator. I got this off of RPG now, um, where there are many good steampunk resources. I really like the Imperial Age series. Again, for me, it was mostly flavor uh, because we we had a system that we were working with. We're now we're now running with Pathfinder. Um, so if I was to do it again, it wouldn't be I wouldn't I wouldn't use them just as flavor. They would end up being source because uh, my players are now used to not dealing with Linux anymore. Uh, we're not dealing with a million tables for my CD. Um, but I had this sent to me to review. And as I said, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with the mechanics of the game. Uh, I didn't find it to be so much a, an improvement on anything we were using. You know, unless, unless your group just loves to learn a whole new set of rules. I know there are some players who just dig that. That's what they live for, you know. but. My players don't want to learn the rules. They want to sit around and do improv with dice. So uh, I don't. I don't want to change up the rules very often, just the feel. Uh, so I need a. I need a volunteer to fill this in with me. Do you want? To? Okay. Good. Are you a man or a woman? Okay. Cannot. Yeah, I don't want to. It's not going to watch this after all this. And you guys have likely seen this sort of thing before, but what, what I would use this for is not necessarily the actual creation. Let's hope that's actually... Oh, there we go. Um, are you a Protestant, Catholic, or other? Protestant. Okay. And keep in mind, that's something to, to remember when you're working on something with a steampunk world. Um, as... Uh, I have, a, I have an annotated Sherlock Holmes, and one of the things the guy says very early on is, despite the fact that God might have been dead in people's heads, they were still attending church. You know, and really you just... Sorry? You double print the top so they're not sad. Oh, was that... There we go. Okay, male Protestant, have you ever killed anyone? No. Why not? It's <laughs> hurt um, have you ever killed and eaten an animal? Yeah. That's an odd question to ask for a 19th century person. Isn't it? <laughs> I suppose, yeah, I guess that's what the thing. What's really going to separate you over there is girl or girl. Yeah, yeah. Are you single-minded in pursuit of your goals? I can't believe how slow this thing is. Yeah. <laughs> no? Sure, why not? I, 
I sometimes just go through and go tick, 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 just to see what I get. I know, it, I know it will generate random, but sometimes I just want to do it. Uh, do you have a regular job? Yeah. <laughs> I like to work. Yeah. Work is what I Yes. Yeah. Are you well off? Slow speed here. I, every now and again, I find out just how clunky our our tech updates are here. You know. uh, do you like to travel? Yeah, very much. So. And this is something interesting about the, the period of steampunk is do just even a smattering of research on what the steam train does to this culture. It's why everyone's wearing pocket watches, where we switch from it'll take you a few days to get there to down to the minute, you know, that, that's the conductor standing with the pocket watch. Do you prefer theory or practice? Practice. <laughs> Have you ever been arrested in your native land? Not quite. <laughs> <All right. laughs> in other words, I haven't been caught. That's right. <laughs> Are troubles to be endured or rallied against? And there again, you know, some people will say they, they will be adamant about this. If there's no punk, it's not steampunk. Well, there isn't any steam half the time. In fact, more than half the time. <laughs> so let's not get down to etymological uh, fights. Um, do you have college education? Yes. Do you for order or chaos? Order. This is another a misconception, I think. I was just talking to an artist down there, and he was saying, you know, do you work with your hands kind of thing with the steampunk outfit? Uh, there's this misconception that everybody who does steampunk wants to work with their hands. I live the life of the mind. I'm a scholar. Not everyone in a steampunk universe would be doing all the craftsmanship and all that sort of thing. There's got to be, you know, there's still all sorts of people uh, in that world. Uh, is the journey as important as the destination? Ooh, this next one's uh, a little bit of that social retrofuturism, right? Can a woman do a man's job? Um, there, are, there are steampunk works where they'll just throw out any sort of gender stratification. Um, I, I like the ones best with the <coughs> struggle. Okay. Sometimes. Style more important than substance, or it's steampunk, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Could be a steampunk world. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Because things like um, Haberlite is the you know. Especially with Wells. Yeah. yeah Wells more than Burn. Because that's the unobtainium. Absolutely. Is Haberlite gets you to the moon? It'll, it'll just take you up in the air, as Alan Morris told me. Yeah. So my nation sets the standard for lesser nations to follow. Uh, this is an interesting point to to work with. Is is the colonial mindset working in the world of Burn? Verna, you know, Vernotopia, yes, it's a place you could, you could use with steampunk, but Vern's writing is more like Michael Crichton's for his day. Um, and Vern's not looking back, He's, he is definitely looking forward, he's definitely futuristic. How long will you remember a personal slight? Oh, wow. Lots of people play inside the worlds of Vern and Wells, and Alan Moore is a great example of the extraordinary gentleman. He's definitely mashing Vern and Wells 
up and doing an awesome job of it, despite the fact that I'm getting a little tired of this one trick pony. Uh, everybody's a monster. Um, <laughs> does the world understand your vision? Any other questions? I should clarify, okay, how, how important is tradition and continuity? Okay. <laughs> Why do you always want to punch the screen? It's the one there that I need to. <laughs> For the city of the wild. City. City bustle. Well, don't you know if you shoot the screen, it actually destroys the computer. <laughs> At least according to I think it would just be more satisfying because there'd be flash shards. <laughs> I'm saying the most before it's the computer and watch it go home. Are you, yeah, are you <laughs> curious type? Yeah. I'm terrified to see what'll happen if I hit calculate. You mean if smoke comes up from somewhere? It's usually much faster. Are rules meant to be broken? <laughs> I think this would be great if you were wanting a LARP uh, steampunk as well. You could just run through this very quickly and, and you tell people this is who you are. And you're not the, uh, are all men created equal? Yeah. You're so forward thinking. <laughs> <laughs> These tensions are interesting to play though. If you've got someone in your group who's just straight up no, we're the master race, and those other people aren't. And you have one of those people. You've got the old classic elf and a half work in the same group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, who do you respect most, speakers, thinkers, or doers? Doers. Yeah, in the Cthulhu by Gaslight campaign, you actually decided to play very much the uh, uh, the British colonial mindset. So it wasn't that, you know, they weren't oppressively um, negative towards other races and peoples. Uh, it was just that it's quite obvious that England is the superior race. Exactly. Um, and we can be friendly and polite and all agree on that and just like, get, get on with our lives. Which, you know, again, plays into the uh, you know, running into the great Cthulhu horror. Well, what's place. funny about that is <laughs> it's more in line with what Lovecraft actually thought about other races. Yes. Maybe they were just trying to be true to the source material. Yeah. <laughs> and you, that, that's an, it's, doesn't, it seems like an ancillary question, but you're not going to go and try to find the Northwest Passage if you prefer it warm. <laughs> <laughs> Is your nation a major player on the world stage? Uh, I think so. In Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so. <laughs> I've got that phrase, and you'll pardon me for the colloquialism here, but uh, I've got the uh, phrase from uh, I'm trying to remember the it's one of the one of the great geek uh, online comics. SAC. PVP. Anyway, there's this point at which one of the characters says, "Cook, you slut," to uh, <laughs> to an, an item. I've always got that in my head. Maybe this is the steampunk moment. We're waiting for the difference engine to <laughs> 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 That's right, a bunch of cards are dropping through the yeah. And we're waiting for the boiler to come up the pressure. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people recently getting really excited you can get a miniature steam engine for Christmas this year from we have those online as a kid. Well, that's what a few guys have said. I just think it's it's funny that so many like it almost seems like 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 you know you need to have this if you're a steampunk at Christmas like a Christian needs a nativity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they use some mechanical sets and you build things. Yeah, you know, I just don't know what I would do with such a thing. Maybe that's the problem. Well, they're all pretty enamel polished and stuff. They're made to be essentially slaves. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Run the pressure up so you can blow the little steam whistle. That's pretty much all it does. Yeah. That's all it does? Mm -hmm. No, it actually turns a little piston. Oh, that too. Uh, like after we wheel. 
there's two, three different planes. There's a steam engine and uh, I can't remember what the other two are called, but they're all the same. Maybe I should have offered to email you all the results. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for attending. Yeah. And, uh, is he filming this out based on when you already have a character in mind? It's not just to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, mean, I, I would do it the other way around myself and then fill in. Uh, but if I filmed it out from my point of view, I am a, you know, a British gentleman, well off enough that I have idle time to play with my cars. It'd be interesting to see if you get the British gentleman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about just waiting for this. It's probably not going to work. Anyway, this is free. Not <laughs> working. <laughs> no, on, on my office computer. I think it's probably got to do with the fact that you're on a public computer and yeah, an it's probably right. and But it, it 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 works much faster, and it's it's been fun. I wish I could drag this down right now to show you the next part of the interface. It looks the character sheet looks. It's got all grassy. Uh, stuff your 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 uh, scores have little you know dials uh, readouts. Sorry, RPGnow.com, and then just type in burn as a search. Burn is the name of the system. You get a whole lot of little there. That's not. There's, there's very little design. But we always try. <laughs> oh, yes. Everyone tries. <laughs> yes, the fact that you have like, two of your attributes, sanity starts high, the two of them all start at zero, and they are inversely proportional. That tells you something about the game. Yeah. And one of the things I forgot to mention was that it's Once you go insane, it can you stay functionally insane. Yes, that's the key. Of course, that's when you start throwing panda by the church. Yes. Because you know the late in the 60s RG song? Oh, session. Sugar, sugar, you are my man. <laughs> I don't remember. We managed to fit the entire song. I, you know what, I played I don't remember all of it. Yeah, I don't think we have a right to have all of those Yeah, I've got it. Uh, yes, I've never had an opportunity. My experience has been <laughs> playing with the things um, that strange. With the expansions that expand your board is just really not practical. No, because you run out of you run out of space. I mean, the well, not just the space. Oh, you have to as a player, you have to get a character up there. You have to try and yeah. keep maintain things in that area, which is difficult. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah, we met earlier. Yes, right. <laughs> so I'm just going to wait for Diana to show up. No problem. No problem. I guess we're going to do the sign set up. Yeah. Um, can we have the district of Washington? I'll be right back. Yeah, you've probably been walking around all day, haven't you? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't know there was an RPG. Yeah, we're playing Mansions of Madness at Richard. It's my friend that has the Arkham with all the expansions. He's somewhat obsessed with the Mansions of Madness right now. Is it a board game or is it a It's a board game. You know what? I find that the whole Cthulhu thing works much better as a board game. I like I like the idea. I mean, this, there's a, I can't remember the name of the game, but its character creation system is hyper simple. And the reason is is that the, the, the intention of the game is to see many people killed off. Like it's, yeah. it's like you're playing Friday the Thirteenth as an RPG. Oh, so there's going to be like there's going to be death so regularly that. Um, well, it's like yeah, you have to watch Oh, congratulations, you're dead. Just grab a new character from the pile. Yep. Oh, what the hell? 
The computer is your friend. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Roll up. You automatically get six clones of your characters. Yeah, you're very much six clones. Because you're going to die. So you automatically just have another one. I know that for some people they can't do it because... Paranoia is also a humor. Like, it's a comedy game. Oh, okay. The computer is your friend. Yeah. This, this will drive you crazy. Um, being insane is a crime. Being a mutant is a crime. Being a member of a secret society is a crime. Being a member of a secret society. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So yeah. almost yeah. everything is trees, and, and you are all of all of these things. Right. Conversely, we can set it up here and she could just look at it and do 
here, but then when you go to your Q and A, yeah. you'll want people to come here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is really cool. I didn't realize you could actually find it. Anybody that has something like this that is able to use that wouldn't spend that much. I guess that's why you need a step. This is where I stopped last night. I was trying to the hotel last night, and I thought, good grief, if it says send, and it really does send something to you, oh, we will wake him up in the middle of the night. <laughs> we stopped and said, yeah. oh, that's it. So we'll hold this for now. Uh -huh. Yes. And so far, I mean, I've been to, like, I, I ducked into the you know, a couple of times. It's been years, just to see him. Oh, it's not You know, I, I don't know what. No. 